All right, guys, game number one between CLG and CC. So we have a bit of a weird draft going on right now because CLG decided that they're going to be funny, haha, and ban Medivh out first. Now, don't get all too excited. Medivh is actually not released yet. Neither can you actually ban him. He's already included in the ban tool, and therefore they thought they would have some fun and go for, like, a bullshit ban here, so to say. The rest of the draft is apparently still correct. So we have an Illidan composition for CLG, whereas CC instead went into Kalthas as their first pick and after Illidan got then chosen they jumped straight into a Sonya Rega. Sonya of course one of the heroes that you oftentimes see being used against that. <laughs> Sudok, thanks for the support dude. <laughs> mm, uh, Sonya a bit of an Illidan counter. But yeah, just got the confirmation that it is indeed like a fun ban. That's probably the reason there, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, when it comes to like the bans, Li Ming ban at the beginning to make sure that she's not too annoying around those tribute channels so that you can't interrupt. The Abatha, of course, trying to take something away from Illidan. Don't really know if Abatha needed to be banned out here because if you're playing in Illidan, usually you're not going Tassadar Abatha. It's more likely that you're ending up with Tassadar plus a main tank. It's normally either Tassadar or Abatha, but I guess better safe than sorry. They don't really seem to be too afraid of Uther being played with uh, Illidan in this case now. We're having CC still with that Rhaegar Sonya, which is quite powerful against Illidan as is. CLG was a bit afraid of the Stitches here playing played against them, which I find kind of curious, to be honest with you. I mean, overall, I would have thought that they would just ban out someone else. I think that, for example, in Nuborak can be really annoying if you're playing with an Illidan or even an Arthas because of that auto attack, uh, attack speed reduction that Arthas provides you. Later on, I could have seen an Anubarak ban because Cocoon against the main healer can be quite a nuisance. But CLG doesn't really go for like one of these main healer type of scenarios. They're going instead into a Tassadar Tirana setup, which as a double support is of course not only a lot of utility for your team, especially with ETC being played, since ETC Tiranda has a very nice stun chain as well. But also getting the shields then out for Illidan and getting the vision here is pretty cool for them. So overall, the setup isn't really too bad. But CC is adding now apparently that Tyrael into the mix, which is actually interesting. I mean, Tyrael gets a lot of value on Cursed Hollow. I still would have thought that they would go into one of the other heroes here that provides them with a little bit more CC and control against Illidan in particular. But then again, Muradin, for example, I could see that. Yeah, I, I actually would definitely favor a Muradin over a Tyrael. Tyrael on Cursed Hollow with the Holy Ground against uh, boss takes, for example, or against like just like zoning out areas, and also Sanctification can be pretty strong. But when you're going up against an Illidan and an ETC, having a Muradin with not only a stun, but also the Reveration seems like the better option. I would not mind a Murky. And I like that they pick it. It might look a little bit crazy right now, but if you go for CLG and you look at the setup that CLG is using, what is missing? It's a cleanse. There's no cleanse at this point. So basically, you're just going to uh, go for an Octo grab, and then you just own Illidan's ass because he can't do anything about it. No matter which target you choose during one of the team fights, it's Murky gets a good Octo grab off, and the rest of the team collapses onto the target. You can blow that guy to pieces. There is not enough to really keep someone alive. There's no Divine Shield, there's no Ancestral, there's no Palm, there's no Cleanse. There's basically nothing to really counteract the Murky in this case during a team fight potential. So I really like that Murky pick as silly as it may sound. He has a bit of a different role in this case than we've seen most of the time when, for example, during DreamHack Tour he was played oftentimes with March of the Murlocs. But this is definitely an Octograp game that we have right there because, like, this is perfect. You get an Octograp off, there's nothing to deal with it, and that is the moment when you're trying to burst the target away. I like what CC is doing here. They have a strong Kalthas, they have the Sonya Muradin combo at the front. I really think this is going to be good. And Snazek here with a resub, thanks for that. And Illidan with a you are not prepared. Dude, I have to admit, I think Illidan, you are not prepared for this game. Because this is looking very strong for CC, even though there is an Illidan composition for CLG. Game 1 in the semi-final here at the Sodi Cup Monthly, boys and girls. And we're going to jump in to find out which team is going to take the lead here on Cursed Hollow. Game number one in the best of three series, ladies and gentlemen, here at the semi-final. And, well, I actually believe that that murky pick in particular is going to do a whole lot of work right now in this game. So, let's see how this is going to work out for them at this point. We're already seeing to the left side, as you can see, uh, it seemed CLG, Kraku on Tassada, Nika on Greymane, we have Krolo on Toranda, we're seeing Shihu on Illidan and Zhuf on ETC. 
To the right side of the map at the same time, it's now Mopsio on Murden. We have Sphixi on Sonia. We see CC playing Lunon on Rega, Celium on Kalfas, and there's that murky pick with Raid Boss. I actually think that Murky is a pretty ingenious pick in this particular setup right now because, let's just face it, there is no cleanse available and that is a huge problem at this point. If you don't have a cleanse to really deal with the Octograp, then especially Illidan is going to have a huge problem here. So I'm a little bit interested to see how they are attempting to deal with this because this is not going to be an easy situation for them once that the team fights really start in the game. But for now, we're seeing Murky at the top lane. Illidan is probably going to play against him here. We're still having with that Grey main also the potential to just really go deep with the damage output. A double support is definitely going to help. But after level 10, it's going to be a very, very interesting game for sure. I mean, Nika is already at the bot lane right now. Sphixie, the one playing against them. And with that ETC and Tyrande, I could definitely see that roaming squad trying to go for a couple of early snipes. And that's, of course, also what CZ is currently a bit afraid of. I mean, not in the sense that they are just going to play super passive, but they are going to try and only go for the experience soak here right now. Up at the top already, we're seeing uh, uh, Shihu going up against Raid Boss and a bit of an attempt also to go for Illidan here. If they get an early kill against them, that would of course be perfect. But right now that roaming squad is also not being put to use since everybody is just being very careful in the early game here. I like the pressure play against the tower here though. Shihu is already a bit low and Mopsio is coming in. It's a bit too late. They're trying to go for the tower. They know that the other roaming squad with Toronto ETC is currently busy at the bot lane where Sphixie is trying to just like zone them out a bit. But he's able to get away. Close call though. And it's a tower for a tower. So pretty much an even exchange that we're currently seeing here. So let's see how this is going to work out for them. At this point, we have in terms of talents, reverberation taken from Meridian on level 1. I mean, uh, if you're going up against it, then of course it's the auto attack uh, speed reduction that you go for. Uh, Illidan himself went straight into Immolation, basically the standard talent for him to take. And we're having at the same time also Wolfhard claim. You see a, the Owl build interrupts with uh, Pierce. I call it incredibly powerful here. And now that we have two minutes in the game, the teams should actually start moving towards the Siege Giant camps to time those with the first tribute so that it can get a bit more of value out of it. Pierce has been taken up at this point. We're seeing Murky going into the bigger slime. Fish tank as the level one talent. And yeah, this is where the fun begins. I mean, Murky already double checking what's happening over there, claiming vision. Not really going to be able to do anything about the Siege Giants, but still, both of the teams are just trying to make that pretty sweet setup. I have to, again, say that I love the Murky pick. Against no cleanse, it's not only that there's no cleanse, there's no panic button available either. There's no Divine Shield, there's no Ancestral Healing, there's no Palm. And therefore, in addition to having no cleanse, there is nothing that you can do besides throwing out a quick shield to really save the Octograph target. So I love what we are seeing here. Oh, Shiku might actually fall already. They're all jumping in. Murky is still alive. Uh, finally dying here, but so is ETC. ETC is down. Shiku and Kreku barely getting away here. First tribute is now an easy pick by Mopsio. He's already channeling that through. And that is the red team. Team CEC, the Crown Cox already doing quite well here early on in the game. And normally you would say that Illidan, of course, is going to gain a lot of momentum as the game progresses, but I'm really afraid for him once that level 10 is hit. I have to say that again, if Murky is being played well here, then he is going to be the nightmare of Illidan in every single one of these engagements. Even if you don't get the kill against Illidan, you might be able to just like, yeah, or to grab someone else, take them down. So it's a bit of an interesting setup that we're seeing. I feel like that pick in the draft was fantastic. But well, they're not there just. So far, the blue team is a bit behind because they just missed out on the first tribute, but it's nothing too crazy. It's a slight lead in uh, talents that we have. Camp is now taken at the bot lane here. We're having another tribute announced on the map. Very well, but very nice timing actually by both teams when it comes to the tribute. But we have an early level seven on the side of CC. Shouldn't really make a huge difference at this point because the level 7 talent is also going to be ready for the blue team in time to fight for the tribute. Illidan went into friend or foe and the reflexive block, the talents that you would expect here. For Greymane, the thick skin and the quicksilver bullet is basically the standard build that you see these days for Greymane. Good zoning here and Krolu gets the first tribute for them. I, I think the important part was really that the first tribute was taken by the red team. 
that gives them a lot of opportunities here. Because even if they lose out the next one, they're not going to be cursed. And that's going to be the really important part. So as long as you make sure that you at least get one of the early tributes, you always find yourself in a situation where you can wait it out until the level 10 hits, and then you can fight on even heroic abilities. Sonya this time might finally die here. Sphixi is trying to get away, and oh my god, less than 20 hit points and able to escape. The Owl should actually hit pretty soon. Crawler is going to try and drop that in. Uh, seems that the cooldown wasn't ready for it. But they now have, of course, at least the presence at the bot lane that can help them to take a bit, or get a bit more damage on the fort out. Sonya was the only hero down there, so Celium had now to rotate over. He's not really going to do too much, just poke a bit from a distance and wait for experience to be soaked up. But that's basically all that he can do here. They will have to let this one go. Murky at the top has fallen, but pressure play in the mid lane to make up for the loss of the structures at the bottom. Mopsio together with the camp and Lunan is currently attempting to at least get the wall. And they are doing exactly that. So, yeah, they get the experience here. Then they even have a bit of a lead now, thanks to that wall falling. At the top lane, we're still seeing Murky. Now, always keep that level in mind. We don't have tens yet. Tens are not there yet. Mid lane had to be defended. Murky is starting to rotate towards the middle, at least. At the bottom, we're having Kalthas waiting to go for an opportunity to take the wave down, which would keep them uh, very close to level 10 now as well. Both of the teams are waiting for a chance to pick their heroics up, but it looks like with the zoning that we're seeing, Lunan is going to pick up tribute number two for his team. And now, with level 10s coming into play, this is where the party begins. Uh, for now, actually, the party might already be the downfall of Tassadar. If Kraku gets stunned out again, then he's gonna fall. But there's a nice uh, move from uh, Murky and also, like, a good stun from Taranda. Here come the level 10s. Murky with the octo grab. Duh, what else? And besides that, Metamorphosis has been taken now. We're seeing go for the throat. We're having the force wall playing by Tassadar. And we're seeing also, of course, besides that, now Mosh Pit plus, in addition to that, the Starfall. That Octo Grab, that's really going to be the crucial point, though. And yeah, the team fights at this point are going to be pretty difficult for CLG because they always have to watch out for that Murky. And if Raid Boss plays it well, then he's not going to jump on the first opportunity to use his ult here, so he's always going to time it properly with the rest of the team collapsing on the same target, and that is going to be pretty difficult to deal with. This is also a curse tribute that we are of course seeing right now, and Sphixi is the only one who's currently there. The rest of the team is just now starting to make their way in, but Muradin is lagging behind a little bit. Celium will have to interrupt, and he does exactly that. Uh, Raid boss is there. He needs to be careful, gets healed, could jump in, and he goes straight for the Octograp, and Starfall is already in. Murky is down. No kill for them, and that's exactly the problem. They went too early, and now they are losing Kalthas. Murky's dead, can come in again, but Lunan is also down. Krolo is even surviving, might finally fall here. Nope, it's Tassadar saving him with another force ward. Here comes the kill against not only Muradin, but also Sphixi is going to fall eventually. There's just no chance for him to get away. There's a good stun, and that is now four kills against one. Raid boss too fast on that Octograb, jumped in too deep, was a bit too greedy there. They didn't wait it out properly, and now it's just two tributes versus two. That's the big problem that they have. I mean, in experience, we have them behind an entire level. Illidan got the value after the failed Octograb kill. They need to wait for the entire team to be there. The problem was really that everyone had to walk through a huge starfall that Krolo threw out there immediately. And just, it was too much damage. You can't walk into that starfall without risking to lose too many of your heroes. The damage follow-up just wasn't there as it should have been. Now it's also a boss that has been taken on uh, the back of all these kills. Very well done by CLG, actually. And a bit too greedy for CC. They need to be very careful how they engage into these fights. They have all the tools that they need for victory. But if they just throw them out like this, then they will be on the losing end of this game. For now, though, another tribute appears on the map. And, well, we have both of the teams close to 13. Actually, in this case, it's only the blue team that is close to 13. But both of them are on level 12. But it's still all cooldowns ready. And this is the moment where we can see that setup once again. Already at the front here. Shihu gets interrupted. There they jump in. Here comes that Starfall once again. Murky uses the Octograb. Raid boss, they're trying to go in. They get the kill against Greymane. Well done here. But are uh, they going to lose someone as well? Murky is down. He will be back in a moment. But the kill against Kel'Thas once again. Muradin is low, but he might be able to get another Stormbolt in. Kraku shifts away. And they are attempting to go now also for Tyrande. Illidan has fallen. This time the engage was much better. Even though it was not ideal, they still had to fight in the Starfall range. But it was much better than the first engage. The damage follow-up was there this time. And now they get the curse against the opponent. Two heroes are down. 
The problem is still that in this case Kalathas has died once more. He is the only range damage dealer. He needs to keep himself far away from the damage dealers of the opponent's team, especially that Grey Mane, and needs to be a bit careful. Easier said than done, of course, when we are talking about a Grey Mane and also an Illidan than jumping you. But if Murky hits one of those targets and you are able to burst it away, then Kalathas can maybe stay a bit safer at the beginning. He also went on level 1, of course, straight into the mana edit, which is going to help a bit with that. But for now, let's see, having the mid lane pressure play happening with one of the forts already being eliminated. 13 versus 13 right now, which gives Illidan the option to go into the Nimble Defender. And we have, besides that, the Overflowing Light running wild now taken. And besides that, thick skin, by the way, I think I pointed out already uh, earlier. So no invisibility, which is actually a bit more common right now on the hero. Murky going into the bubble machine. It's basically like the standard build. Slime advantage after bigger slime and then on 13 and 16 going straight into uh, the bubble talents. It's usually one of those things that you see for a rejuvenating bubble then later on on 16. And now we're having Pyromaniac taking two. And we're seeing the healing static for Muradin with camps claimed on the map again. Murky is doing what Murky's do. Like he's just pissing off the opponent or at least he's trying to and so far he's clearly successful. I mean we all know that playing against the Murky can be a bit of a pain. It's really annoying. But it's still six kills against three. And now also an opportunity maybe for the blue team to get a curse against a CC. Here comes again the attempt to go for one of their heroes. Raid boss does not jump in with the Octograp just yet. He cannot go in too deep. If he makes that jump too far and the rest of the team isn't there for the damage follow-up, then Octograp is not going to do anything. And they rely heavily on that kill. It's actually, I mean, we've been talking a lot about that Octograp and how Murky can really ruin the day of CLG. The problem with it is, they need the Octograp kill. If they don't get the kill on the back of Octograp, then they are very likely to lose the team fight. So it's incredibly important for them to really make sure that Murky hits a target that they is in range of everybody else so that he can burst it down. If that doesn't happen, then CLG is just going to use that Illidan to turn it around against them and it's going to rip them a new one. So they have to be very careful about that setup. Great boss is still getting also a lot of siege damage in this course, since he is just like busy at the bot lane right now. 70,000 to siege damage for him already. About the same amount that Greyman has here. With now Meridian up at the top lane, trying to take down one of the camps. Next tribute is going to be announced very soon, any second now. And then we're going to see both teams fight and potentially even level 16 talents, since that could actually just before the tribute is going to be active here. Mid lane pressure happening now as well. Force wall attempt against Fixie, but no consequence just yet. But yeah, in experience, they will both hit level 16 before the tribute is going to become an, uh, an issue on the map. Now here's already the wave clear. The tributes are announced, bot lane in this case. Already the blue team taking position. And it's just a few minions that you need. One wave. One wave for the red team is all that they need right now. There's like three minions right here. Muradin went straight into the middle now. We have Kriku already going for the channel. That would be a curse. They need to be careful. He has 16 talents. They are both waiting for it. Both of the teams. Muradin is still in the middle. There's the 16 talent for them right now. He went in to give him the axe, actually. Went in to give him the axe to capitalize on the Octograp even more. No escape. Earthgrass Totem. Sun King's Fury. Everybody jumping in right now. There's Murky. Is he going for it? There's the heal. Octograp has been used. They are trying to go for it, but the shields are there. This time, Illidan is jumping in. Murky is already down, and this is the death of Kalthas once. Zomia is also low, so is Rhaegar. Both of them are in trouble as Illidan metamorphosis in. Takes down Luna and Sonya is already dead. And here comes Juve jumping in deep. Raid boss is losing, of course, his murky once more. The tribute is going to curse them. And that is CLG capitalizing on the Illidan. The Octo grab against Illidan did not do enough. He didn't die. And therefore, they could not capitalize on it uh, as much as they needed to. Maybe Greymane as the target would be the better choice here. I mean, hindsight is, of course, always 20-20. But maybe the Greymane is the better option for, uh, for them in this case. Right now, they're jumping in once more. Murky down. Muradin has to retreat. And this boss is going to end up in their hands, of course. Tribute not channeled yet. They're trying to time it with the boss. And they know that they can easily do that. Because just now, we're having Rega coming back. Of course, Murky is going to try and deny it. But it's already too late. Murky dying once again. Boss is already on the move. The curse is channeled very well. Timely with that. So they are going to get a huge amount of value. They're most likely going to get a keep out of this one. But we still have 10 kills versus 4. Fight is raging once more. Force wall already used to zone out a few more of these heroes. But Mopsio is still very low. Has to jump away. Gets a quick heal. 
No Ancestral needed just yet, but Norega might have to throw it out. Starfall already in. Zhoop jumps in now too. Celium is once again lone as Kalthas. He gets the Ancestral. Everybody else is starting to jump in once more, but Greymane is dying first. Rig, on the other hand, also falling in Illidan again with the Metamorphosis on the Prowl. Jumping in. Tassada down. Muradin and Kalthas both explode. Raid Boss and Sphyxia are both so low and they both die. For Murky, doesn't really make a difference, but the boss already went through the keep at the bot lane, and now the core is wide open. Mops, you're already calling the GG, as even with the Octo Grab and the lack of a cleanse, the red team is not able to lock down Illidan hard enough to secure victory here. They still have 10 seconds to drop the core, and that's going to be an easy victory here for them. Well played by CLG. They outplayed the Ogg to grab on Murky and are able to uh, win game number one on Cursed Hollow and take the lead in the best of three series at the Zoda Cup S monthly final, semi-final number two. Game number two on the Towers of Doom, actually. A bit unfortunate in the last game that CC was not really able to use that cleanse properly in the last fight. They went a bit too much for Illidan here. Greyman would have probably been the better target. So CLG is victorious in the first game and therefore in the lead in the best of three series at the Zodi Cup monthly final, semi-final. Towers of Doom could be the last map for this series, but we have in this case already Zul banned out and Illidan banned out. So Zul, of course, with a wave clear can be a huge problem on Towers of Doom, basically on any map. My wave clear is important. Another map will be oftentimes seen banned or taken as, for example, the Infernal Shrines. But CLG, they have the opportunity to finally get that leaving. And it's usually a hero that Nika plays for them. Nika, very, very strong on the hero, actually. And if you are going for these altar channels and you have a Li Ming there, you can go for easy interrupts with the missiles, with also the orb. And if you need to against a uh, potential ETC, for example, you can also go for a wave of force here. But CLG have a second pick. CC picked a Tassadar first, by the way, so they're likely to go for either Sonya or Thrall. In this setup, I would say a Sonya is a little bit more likely. There's basically arguments to be made for both of the heroes. If you're trying to poke from a distance, and Thrall with the Chain Lightning is, of course, the better option. His Sundering is a great initiate as well. If you want a hero that is really deep in the opponents, like goes into the back line and tries to just like wreak havoc there, then that Sonya is oftentimes the better option for you. CLG with a lot of interrupts here already, going for Turanda plus Li Ming. And I mean, a Turanda already with a Pierce can just use the owl to interrupt. Li Ming has the interrupt poke as well. CC seems to be a bit afraid of going up against that ETC Turanda composition again. So they are actually thinking about picking ETC away. And that's pretty cool in the sense that they deny it. But I believe they will have a tough time getting value out of the mosh pit. Looking at the setup you for CLG, I could actually prepared. see them simply going into uh, stage dive here. Uh, will, thank you very much for the reset, by the way, my friend. Cheers for that. And no Sonya, by the way. No Sonya and no Thrall, instead a Grey main. But as I said, I personally really want to see what they are doing with that ETC, because there's already two interrupts with a potential wave of force for CLG and Toronto against an ETC mosh pit. And on this map where globals are incredibly important, I could definitely see them go into maybe even stage dive. Greymane is a good choice here now as well. I could have seen a false step pick. False step and Vikings are heroes that are... You are showing me. Okay. Um. Uh, stack, I guess. Thanks. What? All right, that was probably the biggest single donation ever. Uh, dude, thank you. <laughs> um, not quite sure what to say to that, but thank you very much, my friend. It's appreciated. Bit crazy, but yeah, thanks a lot for that. Um. Uh, yeah. Where was I? <laughs> Did that just happen? Okay, again, dude, thank you a lot. Thanks a lot for that. Um, but yeah, trying to come back to our draft. A double support Sonya here with now Turanda, Rega, and Sonya taking that Sonya away. Falstead and Vikings are usually very strong on this map. 
but both of them have not been picked yet, which kind of leaves me a bit at a loss. Oftentimes you see Vikings bans on this map, and Falset is the king of Towers of Doom since he just can fly all around the place and is incredibly strong with that. But I am a little bit curious why nobody picked those up. CC is likely to pick another support at this point since they only have a Tassada. It could be a Charism for them, but I am still a bit at a loss to see what they are. Yeah, there's a Charism. Why we don't have a false set in this game and no, no Vikings play either. CLG needs another frontliner, and I mean, what exactly are you going to pick at this point? We have right now maybe a Stitches that you can capitalize on the Tyrannistan and have something else that can go for interrupts on a distance, blow them away with Li Ming. Maybe that's a setup that you could use right now. I guess Stitches would be a pretty decent choice for them. Uh, if they don't go for a Stitches, and I feel like even a Johanna would be better like th than the Arthurs. Anubarak, it's a bit more on the squishy side, but I suppose they can try and make that work. But Anubarak plus Sonya should be strong enough with the double support behind them as well. It's you also against the stuns that we have here. Yeah. Kishin, thanks for the resub, my friend. Well, guys, Towers of Doom without Falstead, without Vikings. I'm not quite sure what exactly goes on here, but uh, we're going to jump into the game and see if CC can turn it around and force game number three or if CLG makes this a 2 0 victory with a lot of interrupts against potential alter channels already. So, yeah, second game coming up Towers of Doom is the map, and let's see which team is going to be victorious here. Game number two, everybody, is starting up, and we have a CLG in the lead right now with a 1 0 against a CC. An interesting setup here, Towers of Doom, and I still cannot believe that we did neither see a false stat, nor a Lost Vikings pick, nor a Dehaka pick. Like, Globals is something that both of these teams completely disregard right now, and one of the best maps for global ability, so it's pretty crazy. That draft makes no sense to me. We have, of course, pretty good setups either way, I mean, at least when it comes to the synergy. To the left side, we're having the Polish All-Star team with Kreko on Taranda, Shiko on uh, Sonja, Zhu for Nuborak, Nika on Liming as expected, and Krolu on Rega. And to the right side, Mopsio for CC on ETC, Sphixi on Greymane, Raid Boss on Kalthas, Luna on Karazim, and Tassada played by Celium. So there's definitely a lot going for both these teams. We're having a double support for Greymane to enable him a little bit. I'm still a bit curious to see what Mopsu is going to take as his heroic ability. Personally, I believe that going into something like a mosh pit would be absolutely silly here, since there's so many interrupts against you that you should never end up in a situation where you get any kind of value out of a mosh pit. If you get value out of a mosh pit in this game as an ETC, then it's definitely because your opponent misplayed their comp a lot. So stage dive as a global ability on this map would actually give them a lot more, I suppose. Sphix at the top lane with a nice escape here against that gank that was coming in. And uh, at the same time, we're now seeing at the bot lane, Rega still claiming a bit of experience here. Just doing his job for now. Mopsio rotating over. Early gank so far, haven't really done anything for them yet. So they are just trying to keep that rotation going between the middle and the bot lane to get experience and kind of dominate that area of the map a little bit. The stun that you see for the opponent is pretty strong as well. And that's exactly what Nico and his Liming is going to try and capitalize on. If Juve and Kreku are going to get stuns in, then immediately there should be Nika with the missiles and the orb. We're having Damp and Magic taken on Anubarak. And it's actually a bit of a ballsy pick to go Anubarak Sonya here. Not in the sense that it's not possible, but it's definitely a bit weaker than going for a main tank like a Johanna, for example. But it allows you to dive that backline pretty hard. And in this setup, we could actually see a leap on Sonya. There's arguments to, to be made for both heroic abilities. Wrath of the Berserker is still the standard to be taken, and if you feel that you need that additional spy ability and damage, like Bruiser type style hero, which in this case would make sense for them, and you can definitely use it. But if you want to jump the back line with Leap and Anubarak engage, then that Leap itself would of course be a great tool to take. Both of the teams now going for the first altars, and we have a triple altar on the map. The, the first and the fifth altar wave on this map are triple altars, and that's the only ones. Already the soak to the top left, four shots fired against the core of the blue team. Everything else not soaked yet. They kill potentially against Sonya, and there it is. And Juve might fall too. Yes, he goes down, and that's gonna be two more altars. All three are gonna end up in the hands of the red team. Well done here. Krolo can try, but he's not going to be able to get this one in the middle now. Up to the top, you already see the channel happening. Lunan is busy. He's going to get the shots for his team.
team, and that's a very good start for the red team here. Very well played. The teams are both on level 4, but here's Mopsio already. Celium is very low, though. Mopsio goes straight in, and that is the end of Krolu. Krolu goes down, everyone else is starting to move in now. And Nikkei again trying to just like take down Tassada for now, but it's still a 5 versus 4 in this case. Even though two of them are rather low, they should still be able to fight this battle. They go for Zhuv and they drop his hit points rather fast. Mopsio is about to move away, Lunan with a dash, barely able to escape here. Looks like maybe we are going to see one of those Altars channeled through for the blue team after all. Kraku is also giving Raid Boss a bit of a hard time here. And in this case, Juve actually is able to pull it off. Well done! I did not think it would be possible for them to capture one of the altars. They lost two, but at least they were able to secure one for themselves. So right now, looking at the level 4 talents, we have already Under King taken. So already Anubarak adjusting his build again. We've seen a lot of adjustments, on, especially on the level 4 and level 7 talent here today, depending on the map. In this case, the hard engage into the backline is something that Anubarak is really focusing on. And that, of course, can also have a bit of an impact on that level 7 talent. We've seen a beat build even, at least to a certain extent, taken a bit earlier when Anubarak needed a bit more sustain. In this case, not quite happening just yet. Talking about the rest of the talents, of course, Pierce has been claimed for Toronda to give that additional interrupt. We're seeing ice in the dark now, so the invisibility on uh, Grey Main, and besides that, also the wolf build for Rega. Level 10s are going to be very important, but also level 7 should tell us already a little bit how this game is going to go here. And level 7 is going to hit for both of them very fast. They have currently 3 kills against 0, so CLG has not been able to take a single kill yet. Uh, talking kills at the top lane, Sphixie is in trouble and able to just barely get away from KO kill stun. That was a very nice move here from Toronto trying to get this one through. Besides that, we see at the bot lane also the pressure against Shihu right now. And we are seeing that poke build with burnt flesh now taken. All right, so level one, the mana addict, not even going for the ability damage that you can use with Kalthas here. But we still have them going for more of a flame strike focus over the potential adjustments with the living bombs. Definitely both builds viable these days. Oftentimes, if you have burnt flesh on level one, then you either go for ability damage or you simply go straight for your quest talent with flame strike on level one to make sure that you are getting that extra damage then later on. That can be very, very powerful. Level 7 is of course a really important talent for the red team since they have finally the opportunity to use Colors Embrace to go straight for the preloads here. It's a very strong talent to take, one of the best, it's basically like the talent that makes Tassadar so strong. Sphixi already trying to drop Krolu a bit in hit points and so far that's actually looking good. If we can keep him low that would be great. Everybody else is still at the bot lane with already an interrupt against the channel from Mika. Everybody else is starting to move in here. Level 8 versus level 8 and again the red team really starting to get some damage in here. They're doing quite well, but of course the wells are up for both of the teams. A good poke against Lunan. Well done by Li Ming. Nice job here. But both of them are still poking a little bit. Wrap around by Juve. Kreko is there too. Shiku trying to zone out Tassa. Now they're jumping on him. Krolo is immediately going for it. And there's no stun available just now. Juve is trying. Is he going to dive? He has the burrow charge available. And he does exactly that. Going for Kelpas. Not getting too much done just yet. Shields everywhere. Celium throwing them out like candy. He's like Oprah right now. Everybody gets a shield. Krolo at this point interrupted once again, continuing the channel immediately. Look at how low Raid Boss is. The shield is saving him for now. Sonya is dead as Karasim jumps in. Lunan getting the kill and now forcing back CLG. Juve is about to fall now as well. Can he disengage? No, he cannot. No cooldown ready for him. Both of the frontliners are gone. And this is the big problem that they're running here, that they don't really have a high hit point tank that can really sustain these long fights. So there's definitely two ways how they can really look at it right now. They can either try in level 10 to go for that blow up composition that I've been talking about earlier. Big engage with Under King on Anubarak and Sonya with a leap on the stun target and just trying to blow it on pieces, especially with Kreku going for a follow up stun. Or they can instead just simply try to use the Wrath of the Berserker on Sonya to have, enough, to have two heroes that are both bruiser types but can give them some sustain during the fight right now. With Kel'thas in the mix and Karazim not going for cleanse, there's definitely a huge argument to be made for cleanse and uh, for a leap engage against the opponent. So it's pretty cool that we're going to see what's going to happen there. ETC, that's not the question. What's going to be his ult? Again, I would really like a stage dive here on this map. I don't think that he's going to get a lot of value out of Moshpit. At least he shouldn't. 
As I said before, if he gets a good mosh pit through, then it's definitely a misplay on CLG. They have so many interrupts that they can use to interrupt it that mosh pit should never give you any kind of value. The only value that you get out of a mosh pit in this case is that you hold it back for a long time and you force the opponent to at least save one of their stuns as well. So they're probably going to wait until they see what Sonya picks, and Sonya does not go into the they're chickening out here. They go into the Wrath of the Berserker because they feel that they need the sustain, which is definitely something that you can, of course, like to hear. Already, Locust Swarm taken. ETC still not taking his talent. They're seeing up at the top lane, Lunan and Krolu. I mean, we're going to see soon enough what he's going for. And it is the stage dive. I like it. I really, really like it. I think this is the best choice that Mopsu could have made here. Uh, since he can get good value out of that. Especially in the fifth objective wave. And then also have another three altars set up on the line. 28 versus 36 points on the core, by the way. No talent taken yet on the side of Li Ming. She was waiting for ETC. Can now go into this integrate. Lunan palming himself. <laughs> the owl would actually have triggered it, I think. But he heals himself first. So yeah, we see, we're see we going to see Li Ming going into this integrate in just a moment. Nika had to wait for ETC to pick the Oroch ability because he wasn't basically waiting if he had to go into the wave of force to go for interrupts. But he should really throw out that his integrate right now. I don't really believe there's a reason any longer to go for wave of force here. They need some additional damage. And that too is just too good. Lunan with the channel. Both of the teams exchanging shots. Yes, the disintegrate right now. They're starting to jump in. Shiku is at the front. Stage dive is hitting too. Li Ming is down. ETC slides through and they go for Greku. They secure the kill. Shiku explodes too. But I'm not sure if it's going to be enough. Lunan! Oh my god, he's so low, but he is still surviving. And it's three kills against zero at this point. Finally, they're also dropping Rega. It is a quad kill, and now they are simply going for the boss as well on top of it. Great play here so far on the side of the red team. And definitely a bit of a, you know, of a problem with the combo that is being played by CLG. They don't have the heavy frontliner that they need. Maybe instead of a Nuborak, going straight into a Johanna might have been the better choice for them. Shots are being fired once again, and that drops that core already down 20%, uh, percent, or 20, 20 points. Up to the top, we are seeing more camps taken. Bot lane is being pressured. The setup overall that we have for, for CC is just very strong. Even going on level 30 now into Quicksilver, gives a bit of a movement speed here now as well. Pyromaniac on the Prowl taken. The groupies even for ETC. I'm really liking what we're seeing on the side on the red team right now. Makes a lot of sense. There's arguments to be made for cleanse on, uh, on uh, Karazim, but you don't necessarily need to. I feel right now the situation that they find themselves in is very, very strong because, well, time is working in their favor. I don't really see any big chances for the blue team to come back into this unless they are starting to snowball in these fights. The problem is that I just don't know how they are planning on winning these fights. The heal that we have out of not only Karazim but also Tassada is insane. I mean, AoE damage is not going to do anything against the red team because Karazim can heal that out quite nicely. You have also the shields on Tassada, which can, first of all, preload, of course, a certain amount, and then also in the battles itself and help to keep someone alive when, for example, Sonya is starting to swim away. I really don't know how they're going to plan on dropping targets. If they get a CC chain going with a Nuborak and maybe Tyrande, that might be an option. I really thought that they would, especially with Underking taken on level uh, 4, they would go for a leap and try to blow up the backline, which I could have seen. That is, of course, what they can do if they can fight the fight, for, uh, if they can start the fight with a kill. That would be great. That's the kill against Greymane. Now, all of a sudden, they can chase, and they might not only get those two altars, but they might get another kill. They will definitely get the two altars now. 20 seconds on Greyman is too much. He shouldn't have died there. They need to make sure that they fight as five. In a good five versus five setup, I think it's very difficult for CLG to make any kind of, of plays or kills. But right now, if they started with a kill immediately, that's of course their perfect scenario. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Shots fired already. Everybody's starting to focus straight here in the middle. Already the channel happening. Mopsio sliding through. We have Greymane back to business, but he still has to travel the map until he's finally here. If they can put enough damage out until then, they might be able to even now, focus him down enough so that Greyman doesn't really matter anymore. Here come the heals. Rega is great for that, of course. The double heal is definitely helping. Raid boss is already dropping low on HP thanks to the Li Ming poke. But Juve is split from the rest of the team and his mana pool is actually starting to drop a little bit. He's a very, very oom at this point. Nika also starting to lack mana and Lunan gets the chance. Now, the, the, uh, sorry, the Toronto Owl is currently dropping him. Li Ming again trying to disintegrate, interrupt. Nika is low. Nika is really low and he's about to fall, but he survives. But Rega is dead. 
Again, the five versus five fights are very difficult for them to win. Down goes Sonya, and that's 11 kills against one right now. The only snipe that they got in the game so far was the one earlier against Greymane, and that was basically them catching him out. So a huge problem for them. Level 16, any moment right now. We've even Glass come and take it. The 13 talent on Nubarak gave them early cating spines with help with the damage, which helps with the damage. But it's a massive problem. They even time the channel so that they can take the bell tower a bit further and get five damage points in. That will be 15 against 28 then, which is a great situation for them to be in. So many shots fired right now, and they have a massive lead at this point. It's not only that we're seeing them with five bell towers, but it's also that level 16 talent here, which gives us after the Pyromaniac, now also Pyromaniac straight in the Sun King's Fury. Interesting enough to see that with the burn flashes the level, uh, level 7 talent, usually not too common. Echo Paddle also now taken, we're seeing Circle of Life plus the Dimensional Warp. And in the mid lane, everybody just like burning down a few of the minions to get additional experience and work slowly and steadily to work towards level 20. They can just simply try and play, outplay the opponent in the sense that they are just bursting down structures. They can trade the bottom bell tower for the middle bell tower. They can move them up to the top, play another one. Always keep the opponent moving. Always make sure that they can't just simply force a fight. And that's what they're going to do here. They're going to uh, burst down one structure after another. They're going to move around the map and find themselves in a very solid situation because of it. ETC is already at the, up at the top lane, of course, trying to get some uh, value out of the stage dive. I mean, you don't take that heroic ability for nothing. You can take it or use it during the fights, but you can also just simply soak extra experience. So bot lane is already being pressured. They're going to try and put some extra pressure on the bell tower. Whereas in the middle, we're just seeing four heroes trying to take this one back. So it's once again that exchange that we've just been talking about. And they have the damage output that they need. Bell Tower in the mid lane is, by the way, getting abandoned. They're still trying to go for the one here at the bottom. You need to move back, but ETC is always a threat. It's a huge, huge play here on the side of the red team. They are playing a fantastic game right now. This is exactly the decision making that you need. They do, they're not getting too greedy. They're exchanging Bell Towers. They push with ETC at the top lane. They have still the one in the mid lane, even though it's already very, very low and can be poked. But this is now three altars on the map. They can move in again, claim this one absolutely easily. There it is. ETC should jump in right now because that's the fight that he's been waiting for. ETC on Kreku. Kreku gets healed, but it's too late. He's already down. That's the kill. Raid boss gets palmed. The palm gets triggered, and they turn it around against Shihu. He drops Mopsio, but Sonya is dead as well. And so is also Rega, Taranda, and Anubarak. Li Ming, the only survivor. And this is just not enough. Raid boss is there. Nika can still try and make a few plays, but they have lost so many bell towers already. It's six bell towers against two. We're seeing Karazim just moving up to the top lane. I mean, the only thing that you have to do right now is make sure that Li Ming is not getting one of the altars. That's the only thing you need to do. And this is game. This is game right now. There's no way to win this game anymore. This is checkmate. Just look at this. Shots fired everywhere. It's a huge barrage that is coming in. And all they have to do is just get one more channel through up at the top right. And that's exactly what happens right now. This is the 1-1 one, one in the series as CC claims game number two and forces the third game out of CLG. Well played. Great play here by the red team. And they are victorious on Towers of Doom and tie up the series. Infernal Shrines is the last map in the best of three series. And boys and girls, once again, we're like super fast with the draft here. I mean, as you can already tell, first of all, we had a ban on Illidan. And this time actually first. With CC banning out Li Ming against Nika. So going for a bit of a target ban. They themselves picked up a Kel'thas and Sonya. And I really like the setup for them to already. CLG with that Tarsadar Grey Main Stitches. There's a lot of arguments to be made for that combo. Stitches can do a whole lot in the beginning of the game, especially and when it comes to the Shrine fights, just simply going for uh, the potential like slam build and get a bit more damage out of there. The hooks can be great, of course, on this map too. Tassadar has, first of all, the ability to just empower any kind of melee assassin at the front, help Greymane out, for example, with that, and also has a lot of AoE. But I really like the Sonya and the Kalathas pick on the side of CC. I feel like it's really strong for them. 
this has to think about a couple of things at this point, I believe. First of all, the second healer, of course, is always an issue. Do you try to limit the pool of CLG's heroes? They could have also picked away a second warrior, which I think is what they're doing right now. But another opportunity for them would have been to ban out a Lunara, she, since she oftentimes is played on Infernal Shrines, and she actually synergizes very, very well with Stitches in these setups. But it is actually the Anubarak ban um, that CLG has been prioritized a lot hero that they really like and they played it on this map before he also gets a lot of value on the shrine itself so i feel it's a very smart ban from uh, cc but i'm still a bit curious to see what clg is going to ban out right now i wouldn't be surprised you to see also are warrior ban that not prepared. don't wolf thank you very much for the sub dude cheers bro <laughs> and etc yeah ah, etc is one of those heroes that you just don't want to have against you right um but still i i think cc has a couple of really nice options here Muradin, Johanna, Rhaegar, of course, for the heals. Oh, even Diablo, okay. So trying to punish opponents that are trying... Like, the idea is here really to j take position on the shrine and punish opponents that are moving into the shrine. Diablo moves in, just completely punishes everybody that overextends a little bit, slams them around, and pushes them into the rest of the team where Kalthos is ready with a gravity lapse, and Sonya is also putting the damage in. I would probably like them with a bit more damage. That could be an Arthas on their part, I suppose, if they want to play a very melee heavy frontline. If not, when we're looking at potential range damage, I believe that a Lunara is still a good option. A Vala would also work out with that, since you can even go for Reign of Vengeance and try to capitalize on pre-stuns with that. So there's a few options of how they can play. They can really uh, try to react to what CLG is doing right now. See if they need more frontline sustain, if they need a more beefier setup, if they need uh, maybe an additional stun. Keep in mind Tyrande is still around. So CLG could either go into a Charism, into an Uther together with a Tassada, or they could drop that Tyrande to get Stitches into Tyrande stun and also have Tassada then available, of course. So there's a couple of things that they can definitely pull off at this point. But damage is still something that they need a bit. So the options that they have is to either go into another, either Bruiser or Frontline. Okay, Charism with Tassadar together apparently seems to be the choice. They can even go into Hook plus 7-sided Strike if they feel comfortable enough against the damage output that uh, the opponent have, if they don't think they need the Palm. But what is going to be the next hero? Because they still need some damage. And now the question, of course, that has to be answered is also, how do you play Stitches? Do you go for a full tank build? Or do you go for a damage build? If you do go for a damage build, you don't necessarily need a second tank next to you. You could go for a thrall. You could even uh, like switch it up a little bit. If Stitches goes into a slam build, on the other hand, then you want to have someone that is a bit tanky at the front line too. And I guess uh, Tigers would answer that question immediately. That would lead us into Stitches being played as more of a yeah, like a huge hit point heavy warrior at the front. Tigers, we've seen him before. He does incredible damage, especially against hit point heavy heroes. And right now, for CC... Who let the dogs out? <laughs> John of Cross, thank you very much, dude. Thanks for the post, yeah. It's appreciated. But yeah, CC, that actually is a little bit curious. I really want to see what they are going for here. YouTube watcher here, chiming in. <laughs> I don't have as much stacks as Stack Elite, but I try. Appreciate you, man. Keep up the good work. Dude, nobody has as many stacks as the Stack Attack. <laughs> So yeah, thank you very much for that. It's really appreciated, buddy. A second support in form of Lily. I wouldn't mind that too much. Utility Lily with a focus on blinding wind and using water dragon. I actually think that wouldn't be too shabby. Huh. A Tyrande. I, I like the Tyrande too, but I really think if you play Lily, that would have been a solid setup for uh, for Lily right now. I mean, look at it like this. Okay, let's talk Tyrande. I mean, I don't think I have to explain too much about the Tyrande pick, but of course it makes sense. I mean, Diablo plus Tyrande has been an old school composition where you can get stun into stun. You have a gravity lapse. You have the potential to just snipe a target away, and that's what they're going to try and do. They're trying to dominate the rotation between mid and bottom. Maybe just move to the top every now and then for a quick gank. But the idea here really is to blow a target to pieces at the beginning of the fight. And Tyrande has also then the AoE damage, plus it's Kel'thas plus Tyrande. I actually should have picked up on the potential Tyrande pick a little bit faster than I did here because if you go Phoenix plus Starfall, then you get a lot of value out of it and it's a death zone that you create for your opponent to enter. The reason why I said that Lily would work as well is because you have a lot of these heroes 
are heavily based on their auto attacks. Charism, for example, is trained based on the auto attacks. Greymane is someone that relies heavily on auto attacks. And Tychus, if he tries to go for his damage output, oftentimes utilizes the auto attacks over the overkill as well. So if you have a Lilian, you focus on the Blinding Wind, you can take a bit away from them already. And the Water Dragon itself makes it very difficult for the opponent to just like, move away and puts the damage output there too. So Lily might have looked a little bit silly, but we have see her, seen her a little bit more often. And in this setup, you could have played her. I agree, though, that the Tyrande is the better choice. And I like that setup for CC a lot. I feel CLG needs to be very careful because CC has a solid, solid setup for this third game. So guys, let's jump in. Infernal Shrines is our last map, and the winner of this series will advance to the grand final of the Zodica Monthly Final. So let's find out together which team that is. Game number three, everybody, between the two teams here. It is a tie in the series here at the semi-final of the Zodiac Cup monthly. And well, to the left side, we have once again Team CLG, and it is Kreku on Greymane, Nika on Tychus. We have Krolu on Karazim, Shihu on Tassada this time with a double support, and Zhuf on Stitches. On the other hand, when we're looking at the red team, uh, Team uh, Crowing Cox, then we have Mopsy on Diablo. It's basically a crowd control composition once again. S team CC is playing a CC combo. Who would have thought? Sphixie on Sonia, Lunan playing Rega and Celium on Turana. So a lot of stuns and a lot of like crowd control spells that they have once again in their setup that they can chain up. And it's going to be very difficult for CLG to make some plays here. I really think that from a draft perspective, in every single game that we have seen so far, CC won the draft. Even on the first game which they lost, I believe that they had the stronger draft there, but they misplayed their composition a little bit, and then in the end they got punished by Illidan for making these decisions. So uh, right now, we're already starting to see exactly all of that jumping in once again, as you can see here. Mopsio, Celium, Raid Boss, Lunan, they're trying to just like look for kills if they can get that done. Yeah, up at the top lane, Sonya is taking her position and trying to just uh, make a bit of a play there. Uh, yeah, getting experience, nothing too crazy. I mean, the Sphixie's job is basically just like, dude, stay alive. Stay alive, so the experience, and then you'll be golden. Um, if you can push the opponent back, that's great, but still. Juve already with a couple of good hooks here, and Mopsio nearly falling here. He was at 250 hit points, so in the end he's able to escape and beast back. But the early domination, as you would have expected with the rotation, is so far not happening just yet. The rotation that we see from the blue team is actually quite nasty. Uh, and the hooks are good, but Lunan has the additional speed on the wolf once again and is already rushing away. Kreko is trying to get the kill. They're all chasing the dog, but they're not getting him. So yeah, in this case, he is able to escape. That helps for now. Level 1 talent, by the way, was Viciousness on uh, Greymane, not going for his normal wolf art here. So yeah, uh, we have at the same time also now the Dampen Magic taken for Stitches, a talent that we've been talking already quite a bit about. So in this setup now, up to the top lane, we already have Sphixie, just like soaking experience again, as the Shrine is about to get activated, and that means that we're having both of the teams starting to move in right away to make sure that they get the first Punisher, which is rather weak, of course, but we don't even have that massive wave there that we sometimes see on this map. Here's the stun into stun attempt, but Taranda missing the second stun. Mopsio with the overpower here. Celium, unfortunately, for Team CC, was not able to capitalize on it, and therefore they're not able to get that done just yet. But we have also here the Shattered Ground taken. We see War Paint as well on level one. It's the Devil's Dew on the side of yeah, from the side of Diablo, reducing the uh, resurrection costs a little bit. Makes it a bit easier for him if he dies during these fights. Thick skin has been used once again. Keep that in mind that we have Vision is taken here uh, with the increase on the inner beast situation. But at the same time now, also the Healing Ward. And Healing Ward's for both of the heroes. For both of the healers. Healing Ward is actually like a great talent to take on this map, since if you place it, if you place it like just around the area where the teams are fighting for the Shrine, you can get a huge amount of value out of it, just because you find yourself in a position where you always have a bit of, a, of an area to retreat to if you are starting to drop low. Top lane pressure on the other hand against the wall, and Kreku and Krolu are able to take down both of the towers, which gives the blue team now a very serious lead in experience. So this is definitely what the Punisher has to make up for right now. They need to fall down to the bottom here to get some damage done, because if they don't take these structures down, or at least not one of the towers, then they will actually end up behind experience, even though they won the Punisher battle. So Punisher in this case is actually doing quite some work at the wall. If they get tower number two, that would be ideal unlikely, but they at least were able to catch up in experience, so that works for now at least. Same time, we have Sphixie at the top lane, going up against Kreku still. 
Uh, Tigers, by the way, went for the bigger they are, especially powerful against Diablo. I mean, against Diablo, this is going to be a great talent for him. So this is going to be really crucial. What you're trying to do is you activate your trade with a D and you just move in, get a couple of auto attacks up against Mopsio. Ideally, of course, after he got hooked or stunned, and then you follow it up with an overkill and try to drop the target. This is like the the best case scenario if you're trying to play with Tigers here. He's very likely to end up with a lot of damage dealt out to heroes because Mopsio is a very cool target for him. The higher the hit point pools of your opponent's heroes, the more damage you can basically do with Tigers. For now, on level 7, Quicksilver bullets, as expected, the quarter pack, Titan Grenade and later on should be the target or the ability that synergizes the most with it. The hook attempts always by Jufen, it's always tricky. Going up against the Stitches is always scary. I mean, every time you move around the map and you don't know exactly where he is, there can be that one hook that he just lands from an impossible angle and all of a sudden you find yourself in trouble. We see Diablo going for Diabolical Momentum and we also have Burn Flesh taken once again. 11 7 talents for both of the teams. Here comes that stun attempt and this time it's good and it's the kill against Karazim. Great play here. This is exactly what this combo is supposed to do. And this is actually one of the things that a lot of people when they watch Heroes of the Storm on a competitive level oftentimes don't realize is that certain compositions just like reign supreme in the early game. They're very strong early on in the game when you can uh, just like execute the strength and later on they fall off a little bit. Not saying that the composition of CC is weak in the late game, but it's definitely going to be a bit easier for their opponents to play around it. In the case of Charism, for example, he picked up the cleanse. It was a bit unfortunate that he was actually the target that got jumped by the red team. But he should keep himself a little bit farther back so that he can cleanse the priority target of the opponent's team of the stun composition. And if he picks up Palm over the seven-sided strike, which, as I said before, still an option thanks to that hook play on Stitches. If he picks up Palm, then he has, of course, another panic button that he can use to save a target. For now, though, we have the blue team still in the side experience. And Tassada de-pushing the mid lane is, of course, going to increase that. But they're very unlikely to hit level 10, which would be the dream before you jump into one of these shrine fights. They get a bit of a lead because Tassada is just now making the rotation. So they have 13, 15 of those minion stacks already. It's a very good position. But this up at the top is also a bit of a death trap that we oftentimes see. Because there's basically no way to escape out of this one. Very nice placement on the wards here. Nobody close enough to really take it down. And in this case, we could see that engage. But look at the minion stacks. 28 already. They need 10 more. They dive in. There's the double stun. They go once again for Karazim. And they blow him to pieces. Great play. No, it's actually not cruel. It is Greymane that they snipe. Karazim was very low, but he survived. My apologies. Diablo fell as the counter kill. But he's already back. Thanks to his soul counts, he can just move straight back into lane again. Punisher has been claimed. That's Punisher number two that the red team is able to get. And this one should give them a bit more value, but level 10 is very close for the blue team. And that would allow them to maybe uh, make a play here, but it's not really a window that should allow them too much leeway here. Already tower number two about to fall, and that would drop their road abilities into the hands of the red team as well. So Team CC has their tens now. Dragon laser drill, of course, for Tigers. Seven-sided strike. I'm liking it. It would have been great to, of course, see a palm now as well. It's a safer play oftentimes and very popular in Europe, especially to go for palm. But right now, after the stitches hook, the idea is really just go for the seven-sided strike. And that can really win you plays. The drop against Grayman at the bottom here, though. Very nice gank that we see from Team CC. It's also Apocalypse that has been taken here. Over the Lightning Breath, which would have been a good choice. But just think about the dream scenario. You drop the Phoenix and the Apocalypse at the same time. Two, three heroes are getting stunned out in Phoenix range. And you have a Starfall on top of that too, which of course slows the opponent out even and makes it harder for them to move out of the Apocalypse range. If you get that set up, you can wipe a team away. And this is the big strength that we have on the red team after their initial CC stun. Oh my god, Krolu! Wow, the plays on Karazim with a quick dash is here. Luna barely escaping, but there it is, the Starfall. Plus, in addition to that, immediately also the Phoenix. Not really timed perfectly. I guess they could have tried to go a little bit deeper with the two abilities and maybe get the Apocalypse in too. But in this case, they were just trying to save Vega and uh, snipe anyone that overextends too hard. Cooldowns are not too crazy just yet. So in this case, we can just wait it out. But as I said before, I mean, the early game for the red team is really all about the snipes against individual heroes for that CC chain that they have. And then later on, you're very, very much banking your hopes on your AoE skills. You're trying to use that Starfall and the Phoenix at the same time, and you go into the Apocalypse for that team. 
When we're looking about the blue team, they're going to be very reliant on these hooks. If they get a decent hook and they can use a seven-sided strike right afterwards, they are very, very likely to get a kill. Especially with Tassadar being in the team now too, he can always drop that force wall. So the ideal scenario is really like, hook into force wall so that you zone the opponent out, nobody can move in. You have a single target that is being hit by the seven-sided strike that and Tychus can dish out the additional damage that you can drop that target. You turn it into an early four versus five and then you start the real team fight against the opponent with a numeric advantage. That's the theory at least. But for now the teams are both fighting for the Shrine Moon. This is Shrine number two, so slowly and steadily these Punishers are starting to uh, do a lot more damage. And once again, there's the healing wards. Decent placement here. Yeah. Yeah, so far not taken out, here comes... Oh, the Apocalypse! And all that AoE is dropping in. Look at that damage output! Everybody on the blue team is rushing away. Diablo is dead, but so is Stitches. Both of the tanks are gone. The Dragon Laser Drill is still doing some work. But Sphixi wants the kill against Nika. Lunan is so low, heals himself and survives. Jumps into finish Tigers off. Great kill here. It's a 2 for one and Sphixi is still on the prowl trying to move in for this one. In this case, the 13 talents also available a little bit faster for Team CC. They get another Punisher, and now we are seeing them also with a Firestorm, Pyromaniac, the Earth Shield for Rhaegar, and the Mystical Spear, plus the Shrink Ray for Tyrannum, and going into the overflowing fight for the extra heals. But yeah, so far, so good. Another easy Punisher for them, and look at that, they even stack it. I mean, they have 39 stacks on uh, the minions already. They're just waiting for everybody to go back to the Nexus, heal up, make sure that they have mana and hit point regenerated, and then they go can go in, can time it properly, take the last one, get the Punisher, and now they are ready for a heavy push here. On level 13, Spray and Prey, they're having also a double Relentless for Charism and also for Stitches. Trying to survive a little bit more here. And also the press is now for pass it up. Punisher jumps into the middle once more. And this is now the opportunity to not only drop one of the forts, but also go through the wall into keep. They might even be able to get a kill against the hero if they can lock someone down. Frozen Punisher would help with the additional CC. Everybody rushing away. The route against Krolo, the jump in against Zhuf. But they need to move away for now. Walls are about to be taken out now as well. They're able to basically annihilate that entire fort. Still a lead in experience. Five kills against two. And Team CC so far is doing pretty damage. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty nice. It's doing pretty well. well. Here comes that hook. Mopsio is isolated. There's the seven-sided strike. But the Rhaegar Ancestral hits him hard. And now here comes the re-engage. Starfall. Oh my god. Oh, Starfall, Phoenix, and Apocalypse. But it's Sonya that's dying. They counter kill against Greymane. Finally, everybody is low on the side of the opponent. There's the kill against Juve. It's just so much AoE damage. And of course, Charism is great when it comes to healing that out thanks to his talents. But he's still in a position where he just can't really manage that. So we will have him after level 16 probably in a position where he has a much easier time to make something work against all that AoE. But right now, even with them not dying initially and Sonya dying first, they were all so low that the follow-up is just always possible thanks to the Living Bomb, thanks to also to Ronda with her trade, with her stuns. So the damage output is definitely there. I mean, just look across the board right now when we're talking hero damage. It's a very comfortable lead that we are having for the red team. The blue team is leading overall with Atticus, of course, who is just an amazing hero against Diablo in particular. But we have 30,000 damage on Kalthas. We have Tyrande already with 17,000 damage. Sonya with 17,000. Diablo himself with 22,000 K. It's a lot of AoE. Firestorm as a talent as well. I mean, Diablo is going to get more and more value out of it. It's going to be so much AoE damage during all of these fights, and for CLG, it's going to be very tricky. Again, though, 16. Huge talent for the blue team. It's going to be really important, especially since Krolo can then finally go for the Circle of Life. And that's going to be a great talent for him. In this setup, I'm actually even wondering if Cleanse was the better choice here. I feel it's a little bit of a difficult decision to make here. Cleanse, of course, helps against the single target snipes, but if you're talking about the AoE damage that can be pushed out by the red team, then going into the Echo of Heaven would have been the better choice. So it's a bit of a tricky move. Maybe dropping the seven-sided strike and going palm over seven-sided and then uh, going Echo over Cleanse would have been better in the long run. But of course, it's also like a decision that depends a lot on preference and an individual playstyle. So in this case, they decided to just go the way. 
We have Diablo already on the shrine, and I mean, right now CLG can't go for the shrine. They know this. They don't have the level 60 talent, so instead they're trying to go for the kill. And once more, seven sided strike, not enough. Here comes the Phoenix. There's also the Starfall zoning them out quite nicely, and already Nika has to retreat. They're trying to go for the kill against Stitches. They don't get the kill in, but this was a four versus five. This is a 4 versus 5 that we just saw, and they just had all to retreat, especially Nika couldn't follow it up for the damage. Here comes now Mopsio, wants the kill, he's trying to go for Kreku, here comes that Apocalypse, dodged by everybody though. Very nicely done, already the dash, and then uh, the uh, prescience, or the initial shift taken. Shihu trying to go for 8 boss, very cool isolation, and the kill against Kalthas. Really smart play here from CLG, that was a great one. They were the ones engaged upon, and they turned it around with a kill against Kalthas, who went a bit too deep for this. Another hook! Celium is hit, it's perfect. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. Already Lunan is isolated. Unbelievable. A triple kill. A triple kill against the team in red. The Punisher, during all of this, still barreling through the bot lane, was claimed by Diablo in the meantime, of course. But that was a really interesting uh, setup that we had there. The top lane fight, a 4 versus 5 in favor of the blue team, in favor of CLG, but the immediate AoE damage pushed out to force Tychus back, and then Diablo, after claiming the Punisher, rotating top, trying to get the kills, not able to do that, and they lose 3 heroes. But the fights are not done yet, they're jumping in once again, and they want to get the kill against Kreku, and they might actually get this. The problem is that Fixie is also incredibly low, Kreku escaped, there's the kill against Sonya, and Mopsio might now die too. He could get, and he gets the kill against Greymane. Greymane too greedy. Diablo is falling, but he has the souls. Sonya and Greymane, it's more or less an Eden exchange. Not quite because it was a 2 versus 1, so Diablo needs to get his stacks back, but overall it could have been worse for the red team. I guess they were a little bit greedy there because they saw, okay, there's only two heroes up at the top, you might be able to get those down, but then Greymane should have moved back. They would have gotten the kill against Diablo in one way or another. Greymane was trying to just burst Diablo down before he... Oh, wow. Yeah, that was a bit of an unfortunate stun here on the side of Celium. But yeah, we have now level 16 for both of the teams in terms of points, of course. The armor piercing rounds are going to be also a bit of a big deal here, yeah, but the circle of life, that's the talent that we've been waiting for. Executioner now also taken, and Stitches went into the slow because of it. Krolo is going to explode. Not even the healing ward is going to prevent that. And at this point, we still have the, uh, the camps taken all over the place. Nine kills against eight, though. Nine kills against eight. And I have to say that this is actually starting to become a pretty fun game here between the two. When it comes to like damage and also heals, we already have 45,000 heals on the side of Karazin, but now that the level 16 talent is ready for him, the team fights are going to show him with a huge increase in healing power. Rhaegar with the 53k, and thanks to the Ancestrals that he has been able to drop out throughout the game, has now a very solid position here as well. When it comes to damage, Tychus, as expected already earlier, is at 53,000. Pretty solid siege damage as well, by the way. And Greymane, of course, in terms of siege damage, is currently holding the numbers here. Shrine is activating again. The problem is that looting level 20 for CC. They are going to hit that level 20 soon enough uh, to go for the Shrine, and well, there it is. And with that level 20, now this is where we see the Hellstorm. Uh, well, actually, we don't see the Hellstorm because he can't go for it. Duh. Because he went into Apocalypse, so it's a lot of terror instead. I was just about to talk about AoE damage, but yeah. Rebirth is taken. I could have seen the Celestial Wrath for Taranda, but they decided against it. They want to have a bit more sustain uh, for themselves. Already Rega with a Storm Shield and the second one dropped by Taranda. I really think that in this case it could have gone for Celestial Wrath. One way or another, dropping them is not going to be easy. And this is definitely going to be another punishment. And this Punisher is going to barrel down the mid lane, where we have no fort ready yet. So even though it's going to be a battle on 20 versus 20, there is a huge chance this is going to result in a key being drop. Transgression has now been chosen. They're seeing also the focusing uh, Diodas. This thing is actually crazy. I mean, have you seen the range on this thing? It is insane. And besides that, we have at least one of the heroes already with the Storm Shield, and I suppose that Stitches could very well go into the Harden Shield here, and that's exactly what he does. They need to, they actually try to go through the wall apparently. They're not going for the Punisher yet. They are, have one stack that is missing. They're trying to poke a little bit from a distance to go through the wall to secure the keep. It's a bit of a, I mean, I, even if they lose a hero, I suppose, they can always move back and get the Punisher, but I'm not quite sure why you would do that against the Stitches. It feels like a very risky play. If Stitches gets a good hook in and you lose a hero here, then you have to take the Punisher and you're not going to get as much value out of it. 
one way or another, they decide to go for the punish, and I really think it's the better choice here. Talents are the same, so that doesn't really matter. In this case. The teams are both moving now into the middle, and this is, of course, the moment you have to bait with the punish. So they soaked a few of the shots, and here we go. Now the wall is about to fall, and they're trying to go in. Here come those AoEs. Where's the Apocalypse? Not used yet. Mopsio is low. Mopsio is dead! He has the souls, but he didn't even use Apocalypse. AoEs are already used. The Storm Shield is trying to negate. The Punisher jumps in. Oh my god, the double root already. They are going in, but Rega is down, and that is a huge issue. We could actually see that team just barely survive thanks to the Shields and Tasta. Exactly that happens. Nice placement also for that particular Dragon Laser Drill there. Very good value that uh, CLG got for this one. This is getting a bit insane. Diablo dying in this case, he went too deep, the Ancestral hits too late, Rhaegar moves way deep for the Ancestral, but he doesn't get it through, suddenly Mopsio falls, Rhaegar is the next target and is also eliminated, and now the blue team has a bit of momentum going for them, where they can start to work on the structures of their opponent. From the structural point of view, we still have CC in the lead, I mean, they're in a situation where they currently have all of the force of the opponent taken down, where two of the Qs have already suffered damage, but at least CLG is now able to catch up slightly on that. So that helps them a little bit. But it's 20 versus 20 talents. Anything can happen at this point. We have right now Kel'thas with the top damage in the game, 59,000. Mm, Siege damage is also looking pretty strong. It's currently at 104k. Besides that, when we're looking at Diablo, 41,000 for him. Ronda also 41,000. Their damage output is still pretty much insane. But as we already said before, with the double Storm Shield, or well, Storm Shield plus Iron Shield that we're now seeing for the blue team, they have quite a few tools how they can start to negate this. And let's not forget about Shihu and his Tassada here, who can always go for the preloads. <laughs> Force wall already being used. No, you don't. You shall not pass. Okay, so he's already been high here. Diablo was just about to jump in. Nice dodge on the hook, though. They knew that hook was coming, and Mopsy was just like skirting the edges of that capture circle, making sure that the hook would not hit home. But we are starting to see the push into the mid lane again. And if you just check out that keep, it's really low. A bit of poke is all that you need right now, but with the shrine activating, they're not even going for it. Juve is most likely going to try and look for a quick hook here, though. And Mopsio, he is, he should have his stacks back. Yeah, especially he does have his stacks back. But with that, we are now seeing him in a situation where, of course, he could fall once again. Shrine is active, camp is taken, important camp, by the way, if that pushes and the fight is prolonged, and this keep is going to be uh, falling eventually. Krolu pausing the game, they had some problems already earlier. But yeah, so this is already the setup. Half of them hiding in the bush right over here. We have Juve on the temple, not activating the shrine just yet. Can go for the hook. And now this is, of course, the problem of how you actually engage into it. Cooldowns are all ready. And the important part is really trying to execute again the Wombo Combo. Trying to go into Phoenix, into Apocalypse, and into the Starfall. And then annihilate everything that is in your path. They have a lot of tools that work to that end. And this is going to be a really, really important one for them. Because that Punisher, if it's claimed by the blue team, is going to go through the keep at the bot lane. If the Punisher, on the other hand, is taken by the red team, this one is going to be destroyed. And they have a very good chance to go straight for the core here. So this is definitely something that we have to keep in mind. We have Rebirth also taken, which is going to be an important talent. And Diablo, by the way, he really needs to make good use of the Lord of Terror. He is a huge focus target at the front line. Rega is going to try and get everything through. Rega in particular can, of course, also go for the Earth Shield here and try to help him with that. It's going to be a very important tool for them. Diablo is so far out and zoning so much that it's going to be one of the most crucial heroes that they have in these fights. It's absolutely all right if he dies because he has still, still his soul stacks and can uh, revive. But the problem is he cannot just be sniped down in the first few seconds of the fight. They need to make sure that he actually at least gets the apocalypse off and uh, gets a decent setup for them. If then they can trade a kill for a kill, that would be perfectly fine since he's always going to be uh, back sooner than the opponent. So for now, they're looking at the setup on the Shrine, and they're getting exactly the position. CLG is trying to look for an opportunity to maybe get a long distance hook against the backliner. And they also have Nika, who's trying to just get a few grenade shots in. They're slightly in minion stacks. Juf already isolated. They're not trying to go for the punish just yet. Krolo is moving away. He had the relentless. The stun did too much. Here comes that hook. And immediately the setup attempt. Already that Earth Shield. Well done. But again the heal is too late. Again the Ancestral is too late. They couldn't save him. But Diablo had the stacks and is now coming back. The minion advantage already on the side of CC. CLG, the Polish All-Star team, is about to move in. They are all 
all low, incredibly low half HP. Tassada is dead. Shoof is isolated by Tassada even thanks to that wall. Goes for the hook again and he hits Celio Monasterana, which is the dream, but it's not enough. Shoof healed once more. They're trying to jump away from this one, but the kill against Tigers is followed with another kill against Stitches. Or is it? Here is that spear, but Krulu saves them 100 hit points. But uh, Taranda taking him down. F5 versus 3, they don't even take the Punisher, they take it now with Kelsas, but the rest of the team is already straight on the keep, and this is going to be for one way or another. The Punisher is moving in, we are seeing CC already on the move, 12 kills against 11, was a lot closer in the end than I thought it would be, but a great game here by CC is rewarded with a victory in game number 3, they're dropping Karazim, they're dropping everybody here, and this is of course going to be CC moving on to the grand final of the Zodiac Cup monthly final where they will meet the evil murkies in the final best of three of the day.